Dr. Timothy Knight is a scholar practitioner with 34 years of experience in, humans, in the human services industry. His primary research interests include community organization, the etiology of African American male dysfunction, racial inequity, and theological social ethics. His primary areas of service include criminal justice, community organization, faith-based initiatives, gerontology, nonprofit organizations, special education, and youth development. Timothy joined the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department in 1992. Most notable, he served seven years as a homicide investigator who specializes who specialized in police action shootings and in-custody death investigations. Timothy also established the OK Program Unit with the Police Department and co-founded the OK Program of Indiana, a nonprofit organization. The OK Program targeted the high incarceration and homicide rates among African-American males. Timothy currently advises the commander of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department's Community Affairs Branch and oversees its day-to-day -day operations. As a sworn police officer with the rank of sergeant, Timothy is a consultant to branch supervisors who serve the Indianapolis Metropolitan Community through its chaplain's office, the GREAT program, the Police Athletic League, and the Crime Stoppers, Homeless and Panhandling, School Liaisons, and Youth and Gang Violence Units. Finally, Timothy serves as a co-researcher with the ES Squared research team at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, collaborating with Dr. Jomo Mutegi, the director of Urban the Urban Center for the Advancement of STEM Education at IUPUI. Dr. Knight's participation on today's panel is co-sponsored with the Kadasi break. Joseph Newman and William Stanley address class and the effects that it has on student education. Talked about unequal children equals unequal schools. Talked about language and dialect and how it's used to measure children's abilities and performances. He talked about the ability group being attractive which Anna just talked about briefly. And he also talked about the need for finances to support school systems. His approach was institutional centric. It looked at the problems of the children and their abilities from an institutional perspective. I'd like to take a minute to look at it from a child-centered perspective. Class as an insulator, class as a protective factor, class as an item, an object that can be manufactured, that can be created, that can be reproduced by educators by law enforcement officers, and made available to every student. When I left Indianapolis, to my knowledge, a very powerful person who had been pulled over with a large amount of drugs in their vehicle and a large amount of money in their vehicle and who was inebriated and under the influence of powerful drugs had still not been charged for a crime. Class as a protective factor. Let's look at three on three. Three children. Contrasting three children. The first three children, let's say for upper class, upper middle class family. After a very difficult day at work, I decided to stop by one of the creameries to medicate my stress. <laughs> so I ordered something along the lines of butter pecan something wrapped in something with a lot of sweet somethings in it. <laughs> and while I'm sitting there enjoying my delight, 
up pools of a uh, $180,000, $100,000 SUV. Word pours out of the SUV of three little children and an older woman, but I can assume that you have mother. As they entered the store, I was the only one there. The mother looked and said, look children, there's a police officer. He has a badge and a gun. And I smiled. And one of the children approached me and said, we're here because we did good in school. Mommy's going to buy us ice cream because we did good in school. So we engaged in some conversation with the children and me. And I asked Mom, Mom, I'm curious. What do you do for a living? She says, I'm a housewife. My job is to care for the children. And on that day, in that ice cream shop, she spent less than $20 to celebrate the academic success of her children and give them a sense of value to affirm them in their efforts as young scholars. Three other children. Mom, dad, three daughters. Three daughters, straight A students, 4.0. One of the daughters is away on a college tour when this incident occurs. Mom and dad divorced. Mom, who worked as a health care professional, a human service professional, became a single parent of three children and was unable to provide them the lifestyle that they had lived for the past 13 or 14 years, or 18 years. She became depressed, and she too decided to medicate her pain. In doing so, she struggled to pay the rent, maintain the bills, and her sense of pride got the best of her. She had enough, not enough money to pay the mortgage, but she had just enough to buy crack cocaine. So she developed a crack cocaine habit. The crack was not powerful enough to separate her from her, her sense, her pride, her dignity as a good parent, and that caused her to become even more depressed. So she reached out to family members and asked them if they would come and take the children and care for the children because she was no longer capable of doing so. Reached out to the children's father. He says, no, I am part of it. Reached out to sisters, brothers. She had a very strong family network of 16 siblings and other extended family members. And they all said to her, girl, you need to raise those kids. One of the older sisters went to the house to visit her, watched her washing the walls. She asked her, what are you doing? She says, I'm cleaning the house because me and the kids are going away. She's going away? She says, yes, we're going away. The night before the morning, the evening before the incident, the two younger girls who were there felt something was wrong. They went across the street to a neighbor's house and asked if they could spend the night. The mother says, no, you need to go home and be with your mom. She says, well, we can't spend the night. Can we at least have the Holy Bible? And the woman gave him a Holy Bible. They walked across the street. The next morning, the oldest daughter returns from the college tour to find both her sisters dead and her mom is dead. Mom shot off here. A young man, 15 years of age, a student, he's raising his oldest sister, who's a year and a half older, and his younger brother. Somehow he's ingenious enough to get an apartment. He bounces from one apartment to the next. An uncle comes along because a hero decides that he's going to take them in wants to force them to live by his rules, his standards, his house. For three years, they've been on their own. It didn't work out. The kid got another apartment. He, too, medicated his pain with vodka and marijuana. He comes home one night, drunk, angry, crying, and he's screaming out, why us? 
People hate us. No one loves us. No one cares for us. In his rage, he begins to knock over furniture. The older sister takes the little brother, and they escape to a friend's house. The next morning, they find him with a rag in his hand, trying to clean blood off the walls. He has stuck his hand through the window, and pulled back, hit an artery, and he bled it. In Indianapolis, all the initiatives that I know of that aid to support the education of children in the community, to advocate for fair treatment of children in the community, have one thing in common. There are no professional educators involved. As educators, we're part of networks of people in the higher classes and the upper classes and using power over influence, or influence over power, we can orchestrate a system that brings children into the upper classes, exposes them to a lifestyle of the upper classes to improve their perspectives and to act as insulators to their well-being and their educational objectives. I urge all of us to consider what we can do to bring that to me. Thank you for your time.